Welcome to this video about experimental research design. By the end of this video, you should understand the whole experimental process, the difference between a dependent variable and an independent variable, the difference between the control group and experimental group, and a little about why random sampling is important. In simple terms, the main objective of an experiment is to see how one variable called x affects another variable called y. In general, it is important to understand that experiments allow for the determination of cause and effect relationships, which is something that other descriptive methods don't allow. For example, case studies, surveys, and correlation do not allow one to make a cause and effect relationship judgment. In an experiment, there is a deliberate manipulation of one variable to see whether changes in another variable result. Research starts with a theory, which is a set of interrelated ideas that attempt to explain certain phenomenon. A theory is an overarching idea that is too big to tackle all at once. Instead, researchers break the theory down into smaller, more easily testable pieces. They start out by developing a question about the relationship between two variables and how a change in one variable might cause a change in another variable. For example, I might wonder, does drinking caffeine affect performance on exams? Once I have a question in mind, I can propose a hypothesis, which is a testable statement that proposes what impact a change in one variable I think will have on a second variable. So, my hypothesis might be that drinking caffeine before an exam improves performance on the exam. Now, I need to design a way to test the relationship between the two variables. You might think it would be as simple as gathering students in my classes of intro to psych together, giving them a cup of coffee, and having them take an exam. Then, if everyone got an A on the exam, I could confidently conclude that caffeine helped boost exam scores. Unfortunately, it isn't quite that easy. After all, how would we know it was the caffeine that caused the stellar performance? It might have been any number of other factors that impacted exam scores, such as it being a really easy exam, someone getting a hold of the answer key and sharing it with the class, or maybe all of the students studying hard to earn the good grade. The point is, I don't know if it was actually the caffeine that changed the exam scores if I have nothing to compare the performance to. This is why an experiment divides people into at least two groups, an experimental group and a control group. The experimental group gets the experimental manipulation, that is, the treatment or variable being tested, and the control group does not. In our example, the experimental group would get caffeine before the exam, and the control group would not. But, if you walked into the classroom and saw some students getting a cup of coffee from me, you might wonder why, and this distraction might cause you to do poorly on the exam. Therefore, I could give students in the experimental group regular coffee, and give the students in the control group decaf coffee, which is known as a placebo. This way, everyone receives something, so that it is difficult, if not impossible, for students to guess which group they are in. This helps to reduce participant bias, which might impact the results of the experiment in a way researchers don't want. We want to be sure that the results are due to the manipulation of the independent variable, not because participants think they should do well on the exam. There's just one more problem to tackle. We can't just put people into groups in any fashion that we want. For example, if I decided I wanted to put students with the highest GPAs into the experimental group that gets caffeine, and all of the students with low GPAs in the control group that does not get caffeine, I would be stacking the deck in my favor, so to speak, because students with higher GPAs are more likely to do well on exams anyway. So, I need to randomly assign students to each group. That way, there is a better likelihood of representation of both high and low GPAs in each of our groups. Let's go back to the two variables we've been talking about, caffeine or no caffeine, and exam scores. These variables have specific names. One of the variables is the independent variable, x, and the other is the dependent variable, y. The independent variable is the variable that is manipulated by the experimenter. The dependent variable is the variable that is 
the measurable response or behavior of the subjects in the experiment. In our example of how caffeine affects exam scores, the independent variable is the type of beverage, caffeinated or decaf coffee, that participants in the study drink. It is important to note that the independent variable isn't just caffeine, rather is it the type of beverage received. The dependent variable is the thing that we think will change. Because exam scores are what we think will change, they are the dependent variable. Another way to tell the difference between the independent variable and dependent variable is to use the phrase depends on. You can ask yourself two questions. Does it make more sense to say that caffeine intake depends on test performance or test performance depends on caffeine intake? Based on our hypothesis, it makes much more sense to say that we think test performance depends on caffeine intake because test performance comes before the depends on or depends on something else for its effect, it is our dependent variable. Then you know that caffeine intake is our independent variable because it comes after the depends on. To recap the experimental process so far, we formulate a testable hypothesis, operationally define an independent and dependent variable, randomly assign participants into an experimental group and a control group, and carry out the study. Once we have the participants' exam scores, we can perform statistical analyses to see if there are any differences between the groups. Let's say once the numbers are crunched, we conclude that there is a statistically significant difference between the exam scores of caffeinated versus non-caffeinated participants. That is, caffeine did in fact improve our participants' exam scores. A next step might be to try to publish the study in a peer-reviewed research journal. That way, we are attempting to advance the scientific knowledge surrounding learning, memory, and exam strategies, and we are also giving other researchers the opportunity to try to replicate the study or even build upon it. This concludes our brief tutorial on experimental design. I hope it helped you to achieve the goals initially outlined at the beginning of the video and that you have a better understanding of this important research tool.